The UN says its goal of ending world poverty by 2030 is in grave danger and threatening the very survival of humanity. Member nations were making progress dealing with poverty, hunger, inequality and more. But the COVID-19 pandemic obliterated more than four years of gains. Now, while wealthier nations are bouncing back, a frightful number of people, particularly in the world's poorest countries, are perishing. Conflict and climate change are making the problems unimaginably worse. One out of 10 people simply do not have enough food to eat from day to day. And tens of millions, many of whose whole existence depends on the land, are displaced. The UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development aims to address uh, all of these issues on a global scale, but leaders must recalibrate if they still plan to drastically transform our world over the next eight years. Time now for the exchange and my discussion with Melinda Gates, a world-renowned philanthropist and global advocate for women and girls. The Gates Foundation has spent tens of billions of dollars tackling global poverty and inequality. And just this month, it released its 2020 Goalkeepers Report addressing the UN's global goals. I want to listen to what Mrs. Gates had to say. Melinda, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, as you know, of course, in 2015, the UN launched 17 very ambitious uh, sustainable development goals, including, I think, the most ambitious were uh, zero hunger, for example, ending poverty by the year 2030, uh, gender equality as well. Um, but the world has, of course, changed since 2015. How has, for example, climate change, uh, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, how has that changed the calculus as to how and when we achieve these goals? Well, as you said, these goals were set in 2015, and we were making, as a world, substantial progress on a number of them. But unfortunately, the pandemic and the other crises that you mentioned have really set us back on almost every single goal. It's really been quite devastating to see. And, you know, we're calling as a foundation on the world to really invest so we can continue to make project progress and to catch up, quite frankly, on a number of these goals. Let's talk about one goal uh, in particular that I'm interested in. I'm from Nigeria, so I'm from West Africa. Mm -hmm. However, I found it mm -hmm. quite surprising and quite disheartening that a war in Europe can lead to millions of people on the other side of the world, 6,000 miles away in East Africa, being on the brink of starvation. What has this particular war taught us uh, about the importance of developing nations, especially in Africa, being much more self-sufficient and not relying so heavily on imports to feed their own people? Well, I mean, we're seeing hunger really across the continent increasing. It's really devastating to see. And it's because, you know, 14 um, African countries are reliant on half their wheat production coming from that Ukrainian-Russian region. And so I think what it's shown us as a world is not only do we need, of course, to give humanitarian aid right now for hunger, but we've got to invest in food systems. We've got to make sure that these new drought resistant seeds or flood resistant seeds, because the rains are coming in deluge, or these pest resistant seeds that are available for certain regions, that they get out and into people's hands with the right information on when to plant and then what other tools to use along with them. And those seeds need to get out, not just to male farmers, but half the farmers are female get in the hands of females as well. And then the continent and countries can feed themselves. But as you point out in this report, humanitarian assistance and food aid from developed countries to developing countries is only increasing year on year. I mean, it might be a stretch for my lifetime, but when will we see a point uh, where there will be zero aid, that, West, that developing countries, especially in Africa, will be so self-sufficient that zero aid is needed? You know, I don't think we know when that will be. And I think we were on a path to get to zero aid at some point before the pandemic hit. None of us could have could have predicted this pandemic and not just the health ramifications, but the unbelievable destruction 
of livelihoods around the world and across the continent of Africa. And that's why we're saying we have got to make investments. You know, these are investments you make in a country and in innovations and people's ingenuity because they then lift themselves up and create mm -hmm. their own businesses and add to their own economies. Let's talk about gender equality, because as you and I both know, the pandemic was a real setback for women's rights mm -hmm. all over the world, but especially in the developing world. Um, you know, women tend to have less as access to social protections. Uh, women are more likely to be forced into early marriages, that sort of thing. Um, just walk us through, there was one particular line in the report that really stood out to me, where you talked about this idea that it's not just about women having empowerment, but actually more power. A, what did you mean by that? And B, how do you measure that? What I meant is that women need to have economic power. When they have money in their hands, and not just cash, but money, for instance, in a digital wallet, what we saw, even during the pandemic, is that women, for instance, in Niger, when they had a digital payment made into their wallet, they were 70% more likely to leave their home and go into the marketplace. They were 15% more likely to buy grains. When you make sure that women have protected assets, they can build on those. They can spend them in the right way for their families, for themselves. They can put their daughter or their son in school. They can start to say, hey, I can build some credit and eventually have a credit rating. You put people on a cycle of economic empowerment then, and women in particular. And women will tell you all across the continent, when I have economic means, my son looks at me differently. My husband looks at mm. me differently. My other-in-law does. That is empowerment. And we can do it. And the phone gives us an opportunity for having digital wallets for women. You talked in your report about this idea that gender equality, we might not see gender equality in this world until the year 2100, 2108, I believe, is the exact year. Um, the interesting thing about gender equality is that, A, it's quite hard to measure, but B, it's actually quite uneven, right? It's different from country to country. And in, all, in, in specific countries, women might be advancing in one particular area, but going the opposite way in another area. So how do you measure uh, gender equality? And what do we need to see over the next 100 years for women to mm. actually see more equality compared to men? Mm. You can measure gender equality, but you measure it through a whole host of factors. Is a girl in a quality secondary school and does she complete? Are there female politicians in equal numbers to men in parliament, in Congress? Are there women who are industry leaders in the top countries companies in their country. Those are three indicators out of about 45 that you can measure. And mm -hmm. across those scales, you can look and see where are women and what's holding them back country after country. What I know is that when you empower a woman, she empowers everybody around her, in her family, her community, her society. So we have to get women to the top of finance. We've got to get women in media. We've got to get women at the top of the tech sector because they're recreating the world. Women at the top of politics because that's where we create our policies for society. That's when we will create change. Melinda Gates, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Zane.